folks need to out there. So uh, right now it's like a golden period in some sense because I, I, I work a lot in the industry and I know everybody in the industry and at least in wildlife filmmaking, there's a right now shortage of people. People are booked for the next, like I have shoots planned till two, like a uh, shoot which is being planned for 2023 right now. So it's like, oh, wow. that's, Wow. <laughs> really, uh, that's busy, amazing. Busy, busy time in some sense. So that's been my journey, and and maybe I can come back to it, um, and and maybe I'll let Umid speak for a bit, and then maybe we can swap. Sure. <laughs> no, Hi yeah. everyone. Uh, thank you for attending, and. Um, so I am not sure how useful I'm going to be this con to this conversation because I am the completely other extreme. Uh, Namrata shared with us uh, some all of your, uh, you know, uh, educational background, what is most of you in the audience uh, have. And I actually am a college dropout. So um, I became very interested in driving when I was 16 years old. It was the one thing I wanted to do the most. And as is the case with many youngsters, uh, you know, you're 17 years old, you have to now decide, okay, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, and what trajectory are you going to take? And so you end up making decisions. I ended up making some poor decisions. I thought, okay, diving means marine biology. I'll be able to dive. So I'll try marine biology. But I very quickly realized that I didn't actually want to engage with the ocean uh, from a data collection and research and sample collection and uh, scientific you know, uh, practice point of view. I wanted to engage with the ocean differently. And so I left and I pursued uh, the, the, obviously, the one one has to start making money. So then, the, the easiest thing for me to do was to become a dive instructor. And so I trained up uh, um, and did all my courses to become a dive instructor. I paid for some of those courses by by working in the dive centers that I was learning uh, with. And I started working as a dive instructor in uh, uh, November of two thousand and two. Uh, and uh, I returned from Southeast Asia where I had done a lot of my training and uh, I got a job in the Lakshadweep Islands actually and I was managing a, a dive center there on Bangaram Island and uh, my progression from that time of 2002 till now has happened as, a, as just you know a series of circumstances that have uh, come into the into play. So similar to Kalyan, for example, uh, he left his job and went and decided to work as a naturalist in a in a resort. And as a as a follow up to that, you then start picking up a camera and taking photographs. So I was working as a dive instructor. Uh, people on the mainland. This was in 2002. So people on the mainland didn't really have much idea why is this guy sitting on an island for nine months? What is he doing? So I picked up a camera and I picked up a housing and I started shooting with a very limited intention of just bringing back pictures to show uh, my friends and family that, okay, you know, this is uh, what my life is like over there. And then there becomes a progression uh, to that. And uh, uh, is it okay if I share my screen for a few minutes? Yeah, of course. Okay, I don't... Uh, uh, at the bottom right corner, there's a button called present now. Yes. Just okay, just one second. Um, where are we? Right, so present now. And so Kalyan also will uh, kind of agree with this that uh, so, so this was the first picture that um, won me an award. And this was a photograph taken in uh, Malaysia in 2007 and it won me an award in 2008, my first uh, photography award. And at the time, you know, this was the kind of stuff that I was uh, taking. This photograph became very popular with uh, some of the magazines because it has that human element to it. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, they are they are pretty pictures, and it's not it's not un it's understandable uh, when you're when you're impassioned by something. When you see, uh, for me, the beauty of the ocean was really something that uh, you know got to me, and so uh, you end up taking these uh, uh, pretty pictures and things like that. And it was only uh, a deviation from this pursuit of trying to capture only the good vibes. You know, right now you've got this uh, hashtag good vibes only kind of uh, uh, thing that sometimes goes around. Uh, it was only breaking away from that that uh, uh, I started to be able to even look at uh, contributing and, and uh, overlapping into the conservation space. And so this is actually one of the first uh, photographs that I took, uh, which 
uh, has been used a lot uh, to highlight awareness about both nets and uh, you know the damage that they can do. I'll come back to these uh, uh, slides uh, again in a in a little while. But um, so that that has been the progression. And uh, one thing that you may have heard Kalyan saying is that. So he, he, he started working as a naturalist. Uh, he picked up a camera, but he also uh, was writing and, uh, you know, writing blogs and things like that. And so what I want to bring your attention to is that uh, over time, there starts to become this amalgamation of different skills that you bring to uh, uh, being able to do something, to being able to add value to, uh, you know, what you bring to the table. So, yeah. Now, do you, do you want to carry on? Kalyan, you want to plug in? Or? So I just want to add to what Umit said, and, and he rightly said, you know, I don't think I imagined I'll be in this position when I started out. You know, I really didn't know where I was going to end up. All I knew was the passion was there. I, and I think that's just an advice for everybody. I think as long as you're passionate about it, you will figure out something. And I think both Umit and mine, in some sense, the journey has been similar, you know. All we wanted was be in the wild and document... Um, uh, the wild and, and there are many ways of documenting that it's not um, it's not just uh, taking pictures and things like that so and and along the way i think uh, and i know that thanks for the feedback Ramnita, because i was able to go through what people wanted um one of the things we both of us actually do very closely do is work with a lot of wildlife um, organizations these are potentially ngos uh, conservation organization wildlife researchers uh, so although both umida and me are not professionally into research, wildlife research or conservation, it's something we engage continuously with, you know. And that kind of also is a, is a kind of a profession for us because those are the ones that give you the leads that, you know, the commission you do things and, and uh, it also makes you understand the natural world much better and the conservation issues. So I think people would really want to go down this path. I think if you're passionate and established, and at the end of the day, uh, like me and, and I can watch pretty much every photographer and filmmaker out there is that uh, nobody has a job, you know, nobody's working in an organization. Um, we're all freelancers at the end of the day. <clears throat> and and there are pros and cons of being a, a freelance in, in freelance, but as a freelancer, you always need to have your name out, you know, your work, talking for yourself. Otherwise, you really don't get work, you know. So um, establishing a strong body of work and and getting them to be the right way to go yeah i definitely agree and a lot of you who uh, were on the previous session with us i mean if you're new i'll just reiterate the whole fact that we, what we learned was that it's all a process of kind of exploring the opportunity and figuring yourself is, is it takes a lot of time and you have to give it i mean it has to have a certain amount of dedication right i think everyone who's spoken so far has said that they started off just experimenting and then they found their niche and then they started to get a lot of work experience put their work out there uh, chase that uh, opportunity and then they got into where they are now so i think that's the key lesson that we've taken from both the webinars so far so if i may uh, uh, interject um as kalyan said can you hear me yeah okay. yeah so as Kalyan said, uh, uh, you know, you start working with different kinds of people and um, uh, one of the things that has, I think, brought me to where I am today is uh, uh, that one should constantly be open to learning uh, along the way. And you, uh, I think uh, one thing I want to take from Kalyan, what he just said is that you don't have to have a degree in uh, science or environmental sciences, but your uh, desire to learn about that space has to be uh, at uh, its at its height. Because if you are going to work in the space, like uh, even as a photographer, so you know, going back to uh, just this that. Uh, one starts to then uh, learn 
you know, one starts to look closer, one starts to learn, and then obviously one starts to approach the uh, space differently. So even as uh, Kalyan, uh, you know, uh, evolved as a photographer, it was the learning and observations of the animals and the behaviors of those animals around him that allowed him to then, uh, uh, you know, uh, shoot the kind of uh, photographs that then set him slightly apart. So you have to be open to constantly learning, and I think there's a huge difference between uh, college-derived uh, knowledge. Or, uh, uh, so here is, you know, an example of a, a, a photograph that indicates behavior, and it stands out more than just a portrait of the face of a parrotfish, because here you're seeing it uh, sleeping inside a mucus blanket, which it creates on its own every night uh, for itself. And one doesn't know these things until you learn about these things. And once you learn about these things, then you can include them in your work, which then helps to set you apart slightly. So, uh, and I know that this has been true for uh, for Kalyan and, and for most of the wildlife photographers around that, that uh, whose work you're seeing. The other thing I want to bring to people's attention uh, is that, um, you know, there were some questions in uh, the, the form that you had sent us, Namrita, and a lot of people ask about viability, so financial viability, and, uh, uh, you know, can you make this financially viable? Um, We'll get to that a little bit later, but uh, every photographer, every videographer who's starting out has, uh, faces this uh, thing of uh, you do this work for me and I'll give you exposure. Yeah, it, it comes to us in different forms. So uh, one of the things that we, in the wildlife and conservation space that I have found, and I and I, I actually noticed from uh, also observing somebody like Kalyan, that I give a lot of images out for people, if I know somebody is doing education and conservation work, I quite often give my images for free. Um, because uh, A, it is work that I'm passionate about. I, I know the power of an image and I know what it can do to help educate and uh, therefore uh, overlap into conservation. But it is also a way for my work to get out there. And it is also a way then for the scientists working in some of these organizations to realize that, hey, okay, here's this guy, he uh, has this body of work, he seems to know enough about the uh, marine environment, and I have got work back through that process. And if you look at Kalyan's work, and I'll let him speak about it, but so much, a lot of stuff on, uh, like on, a lot of his photographs are on Wikipedia and things like this. And so he started doing this a lot before I was even aware of this whole space. So I'll let him uh, get to that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Umid. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Umid on this. And, and one thing in the creative field is that you have to do those years of donkey work. You know, nobody appreciates your work and you you have to give it up for free. And like Umid says, uh, it's some form of, I mean, let's say something, you know, but at the end of the day, it translates into So I want to give a small story because I, I want to say how I got my first filmmaking assignment, you know. Um, so like Umid mentioned, when I started photography, I realized that there's really no money to be made in, in pictures, you know. Um, um, some of the best magazines in India, uh, I'm sorry this, this sounds discouraging, but they pay 300 rupees or 300 rupees, you know. Um, and and it's really not nothing, you know. And and the other problem with wildlife photography is that it is expensive because one is you need costly equipment and, and then you the more expensive part is to go into all the remote places. <clears throat> so when I started photography, I actually, although I'm a professional, I was a professional photographer, I kept all my images free on Wikipedia, you know, uh, a, a high resolution. So a lot of people used to make fun of me, are you crazy? I mean, you know, if photography is your profession and if you're putting all your pictures out, you know, how are you going to make money? Uh, it's, it's through services. So uh, this was in 2006, you know, before 2007, I remember. BBC was doing a film about frogs, you know, and uh, one of the frogs they wanted to feature was this uh, frog called a purple frog, which is found in the Western Ghats, it's extremely uh, rare. And I was working with a wildlife NGO, and because of that, I got access to seeing this rare frog, I photographed it. And when people in BBC were looking for this frog, that's the only image that could come across on, on the internet. So that's the first thing they contacted me saying, hey, we clearly know that this frog is found, uh, would you like to work on this project, you know? So that's really how I got my first break with BBC because of keeping my images uh, free on, on the internet. You know, so uh, you really have to build. I, I think 
<clears throat> unlike other traditional uh, so other uh, professions where you have an established um, career path, uh, I think this is one industry where it's not established, and and you kind of have to create your own market and and specialization also. For example, Umid, um, he really specialized in underwater. So anywhere in Asia, if anybody says, okay, we need an underwater photographer, you know, they know him to call because they know Umid is the underwater guy. You know, so. Uh, creating speciality over time is is of course very important. You can't be a generalist, um, who, who, uh, whole kind of things. So, uh, so that's what I wanted to add about keeping your work free and and Nice, that was super super helpful. Um, Umid, would you like to add anything? Uh, do you want to ask anything specific, or shall I just continue with what I had? Uh, uh, so we what happened. We have three questions as of now. We can take them and then you can go back to your sites. So what are um, the questions? Um, Khan had asked, what mainly are the skills for photography? <laughs> what mainly are the skills for photography? <laughs> uh, so nowadays, it depends on uh, where you're going to have your photography, uh, you know, uh, uh, put out. But nowadays, there are people who are creating amazing things with uh, uh, different kinds of equipment, right from phones to then GoPros to then point and shoots to then DSLRs to then the really high end cameras that Kalyan and uh, uh, you know uh, people like that use. So I don't want to get too much into equipment because equipment is a different beast altogether. But having said that, one of the skills that has uh, uh, helped me definitely is that you have to know your equipment like the back of your hand. So you have to become fully familiar with whatever equipment you might be using. It might be something quite simple. It might be something very complex, but you have to know your, there's no excuse. If you have a camera, if you want an, a camera there and you want to get into this space, there's no excuse for not knowing your uh, equipment like the back of your hand. And the other skill that I'm going to add, and then I'll let uh, uh, Kalyan add some of his, is you have to spend the time. He's already said this a couple of times. You have to spend the time. There is no shortcut as such. Uh, one has to put the time in. Oh, yeah, you did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I slightly uh, like to uh, slightly differ with, with Umid on this. You know, at least <clears throat> because the technicalities of photography you can learn in a week. You know, um, the shutter speed, ISO exposures, and and even post processing today it's so easy. Uh, you can do it. I really think for a photographer to stand out, uh, the, the right, the true skill is storytelling, you know. And for example, some of the Im images that Umid was showing earlier, every image tells a story. And, and that's really the key. I think if you're able to uh, tell stories through images, I think that's when you can really excel as a, a wildlife photographer. In fact, I tell people that I think the best way to become, like, improve your skills as a wildlife photographer is, you know, read a lot of books, watch a lot of movies, you know, and, and travel alone. I, I, I have these strong pillars because, you know, it, it's, it's only <clears throat> only when you know the world better that you will be able to capture those things and actually document those things. You know, you can't be a now. And of course, uh, you, you need to know your wildlife. And as Umid says, there are a lot of times where we spend days and weeks without time coming back completely empty handed. So it's spending a lot of time in the field. Like I spend more than 200 days a uh, year out in the field. Um, and for my films that I do for especially the BBC and Netflix films, for what will be a one minute clip in the final film, I typically have to spend about two weeks of time minimum uh, to get all the shots required for that. You know? So, um, and of course it's fun. I mean, I think both of me that can vouch for it is that we enjoy doing that being in the forest and our, in, in a meat case, uh, underwater. Um, but yeah, I think more than equipment, I think it's, it's the art of storytelling and communication that's important. And your tolerance to be covered in leeches. <laughs> and things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a question over here uh, which says, does going to school for photography give us more exposure and more work in the future or is it better off to invest in gear and save that money which we will exhaust in photography school? I can't answer this question conclusively. There used to be a time where once my interest in photography started to increase, I then used to think back and say, oh, I wish that I had started gone to photography school instead of going to marine biology school. But as I have also uh, curated my own learning and, uh, uh, and I also am the kind of person who doesn't like being in a classroom, I like being outdoors, I like experiential learning. So for me, this method worked better. Uh, 
I don't think Kayan has also had any formal training as such from photography and video school, but I'll let him tell you his opinion on that question. I definitely don't think it's required. In fact, all the professional photographers I know, not just in India, around the world, none of them have come from a formal uh, photography background. And same with filmmakers, every cameraman I know, not just in India, around the world, none of them have actually, I mean, maybe one or two, but it really, and, and what Umir was uh, saying earlier, which I completely agree with, is that there's nothing like field experience in this. You know, it's just going out there, spending time and, and uh, learning your skills yourself. So, um, by going to a school or a prestigious school has absolutely um, no advantage uh, in, in this. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have another question from Saram. It says, are there any agencies to whom we can pitch unedited wildlife footage or time lapses to? So if, I think they essentially just want guidance on once you have that footage, how do you get it out there in the world apart from your social media handlers? So yeah, so Sarang, I think Manisha also has a similar question after that. Uh, I think I can answer them together. So I really, yeah. there isn't an agency that's always looking for footage, you know. Um, eventually agencies are looking for a uh, full-fledged stuff. So, and, and one of the things I say is that if you want to be a cameraman, you need to know how to edit. You don't need to be an editor. But it's only when you start editing that you realize that, oh, I wish I had taken that shot like this, or, you know, I wish I had taken a different angle because only in the editing room you realize, you know, it doesn't I have the punch. So what agencies are looking for is the next story to tell, you know. Um, so, uh, for example, um, you know, like Sarang, I mean, I know Sarang from before, you know, he, he, doc I, uh, he documents a lot on the Marine coastline, you know. So if, if you put an agency saying that, you know, I have this knowledge, this is the, what I've documented, and maybe I can make a half an hour film about it. Um, and this is the rough story. That's, that's what they're really looking for. Um, and the agencies are usually uh, uh, television channels like, you know, I mean, you know, BBC Discovery and all these uh, places. Uh, but most often they go with trusted people. So I think that in this industry, instead of you approaching people, I think you have to uh, publish your work such a way that the, in, uh, the agencies come to you. You know, in fact, most of my work, I never pitched anything in my life. It's always them contacting me because they've seen my film somewhere or my photograph somewhere else. So uh, that's really the way to make it work. Okay. And also, I, I just thought of this question that I've heard a lot of photographers ask. Um, when you start out, would you recommend working with someone, someone who's established in the field, or would you recommend just going out on your own? Or is it situation based? I think it's situation based, but I think it definitely helps the, the initial days. Like I said, I mean, take, uh, I mean, I, although I was uh, trivializing the technical aspects, it, it takes um, many years to master the art of it. So if I'm working under something like, yeah, I'm mean, doing an internship under an established photographer, filmmaker would definitely help. It just uh, uh, your learning is much quicker, basically. Okay. Nice. Umid, would you like to add anything to that? I think uh, one has to uh, look at oneself and uh, get a little clarity on how do I like to learn. I am, I, me personally, I learn in a very particular manner. And so now that I've understood what that particular manner is, I try to maximize my learning experiences in that manner. And for me, very often that is by myself. So I am somebody who enjoys learning by myself. Uh, I go out, I practice, I fail. Now it's so easy. You, you screw up on your screen. You know that you screwed up and uh, you're not shooting film. So, you know, you, you try again and you try again and you try again. So um, there again, uh, as Kalyan was saying, there were times when I wish that I had uh, uh, access to a mentor, but it was not something that I pursued so much because I also found that uh, learning experientially by myself was something that I actually enjoyed and I thrived on that. So, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's specific to how you as an individual uh, uh, are and, you know, what, uh, yeah. Well, one thing I, I mean, I don't want to sound this as a disparaging thing, but one thing I want to add is that most of the people in this industry work alone. You know, it's not like I have five, six assistants. I have actually only one part-time assistant. That's it. You know, I have other filmmakers who might give out work for, but uh, as an assistant, I believe because even Umi can watch for this because we kind of work alone in the field and most of the time you don't want another person. I mean, wildlife is different on like making traditional films and things like that. Okay. 
Okay, uh, Navrata asked, how do you edit your pictures? What would you suggest is the best software and preferably free ones, which I think all of us are sharing. <laughs> I use Lightroom, which is not free. Uh, it's not very overly expensive right now. For I think it's about seven hundred, six hundred, and something seven hundred rupees for the basic Photoshop suite. Uh, but I use Lightroom and Photoshop, and so I've not tried out any free editing software. Sorry, I don't have much information on that. So uh, same here. I use Lightroom and Photoshop, uh, and it's not very expensive. But that's it. There's a software called as Jim, G-I-M-P, um, which is a free open source alternative for Photoshop. It's a bit clunky software, but uh, it does the job. Okay. Great. Um, Harshit had this question. While approaching NGOs, environmental organizations for access and collaboration, oops, I just lost the volume one second, sorry. Um, huh. What do they look for in return? So, uh, Kalyan, I go first. Yeah, please go ahead. So, uh, one of the things I think that's important is uh, if you find an NGO that is doing work that is aligned with your own uh, everything, model compass, the way that you like, uh, you know, the, the kind of work that they're doing and things like that, I think it's uh, important to build a relationship with them uh, over time. And so, you will find that your interaction with them varies over time. So when I find somebody that uh, I want to work with, I usually actually end up uh, starting by uh, offering them something without any expectation in return. And so I do this with a lot of agencies. Some of them are very large international agencies. Some of them are a lot closer to home, smaller agencies. Right now, for example, Dakshin Foundation is uh, you know doing this fundraiser for uh, uh, fish workers and so I have offered them that use my images I, I have a relationship with them already but I've offered them that use my images uh, uh, if that helps you in some way to uh, you know get more funds for this fundraiser so then what happens is that you become uh, noticed uh, you get filed away and then uh, uh, they come back to you with projects and I personally when it comes to NGOs I personally go on a project by project basis sometimes an NGO is going to get funding from a very large organization like a GIZ or uh, you know a, a Wipro or, uh, or one of the Azim Trenji Foundation or some some of these guys and so then when you know that there is money available then I feel that being fair and being upfront and putting uh, a value to your work where you say that this is the amount of monetary uh, uh, remuneration that I would like is something that you should stand up for for yourself. But do, on, on other cases where I know that the budgets are very small, there's very no, there's no money, but I still want to contribute because of the conservation and education ripple effect that might uh, come off it. Then in those cases, I make uh, exceptions. So it's on for me. It's always been on a project by project basis. Yeah, okay. Kalyan, is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with. And most of my work, for example, I um, so what Umido said is right. And especially when I started out my career, that's what I would do. You know, I would give my images free, of course, for them. But in exchange, um, one is of course you build the relationships, but also. I, one is you get access, for example, you know, um, because many times the researchers and the scientists who have access to certain areas, which as a photographer, it's very hard to get. So once you become part of the team, uh, you get access to a lot of these things. And for many years, um, I've done that free free work when I was establishing myself. But today, because of this relationship that you build, like Umid said, one is, of course, when they want to do a film or, or some photography time and they contact you. But not only that, it's when somebody else contacts them saying that, hey, we'll be a photographer or you know, we want to do a film, then they say that, hey, you know, we work exclusively with Umid or Kalyan or whatever, and, and we want you to work through them, you know. So it really opens up a lot of doors uh, having those things. So if, if you want to do it, I mean, I, I can definitely say that when me and Umid started about 15 odd years ago, um, there were very little, very uh, few high quality images. Uh, but now the images is uh, quite, um, I mean, there are quite a few images out there. So these days, I think most NGOs and organizations are looking for short films, you know, for their, either for their fundraising or just to talk about their project and things like that. So if you volunteer and say that, hey, you know, I'll make this two minute film, you know, it'll probably take you a couple of days, they'll be really happy and you establish the relationship with them. Okay. So would that mean that um, there's more demand for films rather than for photography right now? 
I mean, like, not demand, but just um, saturation. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, are there yeah. enough people? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So for, for um, those... such an advanced. Um, Sorry, you can continue. Yeah, sorry. So for those of you who are, uh, so so Kalyan is very much in the uh, film space. I'm kind of uh, in the middle. I'm you know transitioning from photography into film, but I don't think I will ever give up photography also as such. Um, but for those of you who aren't in the film space and you're in the photo space, there are a couple of things. One is that uh, when I sh when I approach a scene, I shoot different kinds of images because in my mind, I've got a sense of that this kind of image can go to this publication this kind of image can go to this publication, this kind of image can go to that publication. So when I'm approaching a scene, if I have the luxury of time, then I shoot like that. And within my own work, I have the images that are what I consider my favorites or the best, and then a second tier of images, which are the ones that I usually give out for free or uh, you know things like that to, to uh, get uh, myself noticed. Nowadays, you guys, there's actually quite a lot. Uh, I have a steady, it's a small, uh, uh, as part of my income, but I have a steady uh, part of my income that comes from uh, photos, which I either write as part of photo essays, or I myself am writing the article, or I'm contributing photos to articles that other people have written. Now, as Kalyan said, sometimes you're getting anywhere between 200 to 500 rupees for a, a, a photograph. But if you uh, have a network where you're doing uh, three or four articles in a month, then it's a small complimentary trickle of monies that are coming in. But it's also a way then to uh, get exposure because those articles, even if they get printed on a website, usually there'll be an Instagram post that uh, you know is put out, things like that. So don't give up on that space. I, I know that it might not be a very encouraging space, uh, but don't give up on that space because there are people that are are looking for a lot of content right now. Okay, that's great. So, Umid, you mentioned that um, when you approach a particular situation, you visualize it in your head, what according to you would be the best uh, image for a particular publication. So how did you sharpen that skill? How, how did you go about, what's the process behind that? So a lot of it, as uh, uh, Kalyan said, it's about uh, being aware. So I'm not a huge fan of, uh, or, or there was a time when I looked at a lot of other people's work. So when I was starting to do my underwater photography, I was looking at a lot of other people's work. And it's something that uh, if you apply various lenses to your own observation, then you start to realize that, oh, see, okay, in, in your Condé Nast Traveler magazine, uh, all, uh, in the underwater photography section, these are the kind of images. In your Save Us magazine, these are the kind of images. In your BBC uh, magazine, these are the kind of images and you start to separate that. So again, just, uh, you know, uh, 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 sharing a window. Um, so this, whoops. Uh, where is that? Right. No, not that one. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a kind of image that uh, then I shot for a long-term interaction with Touching Foundation for the work that they were doing with um, fishing communities and sustainable uh, uh, fisheries. You know, uh, this is an image that has gone to many articles about uh, uh, manta rays. So even though the article itself might be uh, pretty pictures of the manta rays and stuff like that, most publications, this one went in fact to NIF, which is some uh, thing that Kalyan has founded, on an article on manta rays. And this was a fish landing site in uh, Sri Lanka, where this manta, this is the head of the manta, where my cursor is right now, and it's been cut up. And this one is from the Andaman Islands, you know? So, so you automatically start to understand uh, that, okay, this kind of an image will find a use over here. And I'll let me tell you something, very little actually goes to waste. So uh, I found that I've stored images which I've shot 10 years back and now some of them are starting to be put to use because somebody wants, you know, or oh, do you have a portrait of this fish kind of thing, you know? So, yeah. Okay. So I, I agree with yeah, I agree with Umid uh, exactly on this. And and when something is playing out, even in me, it's like, oh, that shot will work for this. But I'll give you a simple example, right? For like the Umid one mentioned, you know, you photograph 
tiger. You know, it's tigers walking the beautiful grassland or whatever. You take these amazing portraits and things like that. But eventually, you know, the tiger might come on a road and you might actually, you might be able to take a picture where there's some 10 jeeps behind the tiger and this tiger's crossing the road. And a lot of photographers don't take that because that's not a pretty image. Uh, but people like me and Umi will actually take that photograph because that photograph is probably going to sell much more than the pretty picture of the tiger because we already know that whenever there will be a story about tourism or impact of tourism on wildlife, they would want this kind of image, right? Um, so I, I do agree with Umi. I mean, I think we, you're just not randomly going and clicking there. Right? You know, you kind of, when you're taking pictures, you know that it's going to go for this or it's going to be useful for these, these related issues. <laughs> Yeah, and Harshit actually asked this question right now. He said, don't you feel there's more uh, need for films and photo projects that talk about man-animal conflict and coexistence issues rather than national history and films? So that's something that both of you are agreed to, right? Um, so there's a yes and no to that. And I'm actually just looking for an article uh, right now that I want to share. Um, so, uh, well. so let me answer that while we yeah. are pulling up. Okay, fine. Uh, I mean, I definitely think that you, ne you need both. Um, in fact, if you want to make people care about wildlife, they need to know what wildlife is there and they need to be fascinated by it, you know. So I think you always start with those pretty pictures because people will be like, oh, wow, that animal is amazing. Like if, if Umid's doing a story on manta rays, for example, the first photo is not going to be that not open one. It will be the pretty picture of manta rays saying, you know, this is this beautiful creature in the ocean, you know, uh, show the pretty pictures. And only once people fascinated about wildlife, then you feed them the conservation, the hard hitting issues. Uh, sometimes it's very depressing. I've done films about human wildlife conflict and, and things. It's, 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 it's kind of getting into photojournalism space. Um, and it is very depressing, but it is important to tell both sides of the story. So I think it's, it's being able to keep your eyes open and looking up the story. So I'm trying to find an article, but I'm not able to do it. It was an article shared by Pooja Rathor actually, and she was one of the uh, camera people on the Wild Karnataka uh, shoot. And uh, uh, the article was about the impact that just um, uh, natural history films have on getting people curious and aware. So here is now a personal choice. And so Harshit, to answer your question, do you feel there is more need for film photo projects to talk about man-animal conflict? There definitely isn't. And uh, yeah, Kalyan is a, um, uh, has a much larger body of work in this sphere. So he'll tell you that his body of work includes films like that. but don't discount see we are being saturated and overwhelmed and bombarded by negativity nowadays you know and i i face this a lot in the education programs that i run where uh, kids are completely depressed they uh, they don't know how to uh, deal with okay i've got climate change i've got global warming i've got coal i've got uh, uh, fish populations declining and uh, uh, you know extinctions of animals so every once in a while you need to engage people on a different level and if that is simply to instill curiosity beauty or happiness within them there can be ripple effects to that as well so that is not a wasted exercise uh, uh, to 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 Put your efforts into also connecting the man-animal conflicts, absolutely. One should also work in that space. So I just want to give an example. Very well said. Example recently, a project that me and Umir have worked together was this film called Wild Karnataka that we made. Um, and it, it's done extremely well it's to celebrate wildlife of Karnataka. It even played in PVR and things like that. Um, and some of the people said, hey, there's no conservation in it, you know. It's all pretty stuff. But the way people take pride, you know, their, their eyes swell up when they see the film and, and saying that you know, this is the kind of wildlife we have. And after this, you feed them, like you said, the hard hitting stories when they will care something about or do something about it. Yeah, I actually agree with you so much on that because I went for the movie while I was in doing my MBA very recently in Chennai and I dragged a couple of my friends who are of course doing their MBA as well and they don't care much for nature, right? But once they came and watched that movie with me, I could see that okay, they're starting to think differently. And that's the kind of impact that such movies have. So yeah, definitely. Harjit, I hope that answers your question. So this, uh, um, where's my screen now? 
So it really depends on the film that uh, you're doing. Um, for example, a uh, couple of years ago, um, uh, our BBC was doing this film on monsoons. So it's a five-part series. So I literally went and met every wildlife researcher friend of mine and saying that, hey, do you know any animal that does something different because of monsoon? You know, and and from there we pick stories. You know, in fact, one of my friend here he said, oh, by the way, do you know in monsoon these shepherds come near my house in Maharashtra and these wolves come every night? I said, really? I said, yeah, yeah, they they migrate during monsoon and and that was the story. You know, we followed, it. we kind of chased it up and things like that. So. It really depends on the kind of film that you're doing. Um, actually, me and Umid, our next project, I can actually reveal it, it's, it's public now, is uh, after Karnataka, we're doing Wild Tamil Nadu. You know, um, and, and uh, right now I'm in that position where I'm literally talking to every forest officer, every researcher who's worked in Tamil Nadu saying, hey, what's the cool wildlife do you get in your backyard or in, and which time of the year do you get it and things like that. So, and, and then I need to pick stories based around how it fits in and also have the diversity. For example, you can't have a film with 10 stories about birds. So you need a combination of mammals, birds, insects, sometimes conservation stories. So it's trying to put this all on a big, like I, I use post-it notes, you know, kind of put it on a wall and we can just saying, okay, which one works, which one doesn't work. And okay, great. Um, Umid, is there anything that you'd like to add or should I move on to another question? No, we can move on. Okay, cool. Uh, Dhwani was basically asking for some advice on how to start off um, as an intern or uh, as a volunteer. So do you know any um, agencies, any filmmakers who are looking to hire people or how does that work? How can someone volunteer with you if that so was I, possible? I'll let Kalyan uh, come to that after I just share this uh, slide because I had put down a couple of ones that I think uh, uh, people should, uh, even if they don't have any openings, people should definitely uh, check them out. Uh, where is the share screen button? Right, present now. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, these are some of the organizations that I've worked directly or indirectly with. Um, and uh, so I want all of you to, and I can send this list to you, Namrita, so that you can put yeah. it up there. Um, okay. I want you to, to, to just look them up because you will never know uh, when somebody is ask, uh, has, a, has a job opening. Sometimes it's a paid position, sometimes it's a volunteer position. And uh, all these organizations have engaged people on levels that do not require a a uh, degree in science or wildlife biology or ecology. And uh, so when I worked at ANET, uh, we were doing a lot of work with artists and social media people. Uh, we, we did some work with journalists, Duction Foundation, NCF, Terra Conscious, Sanctuary Magazine, NIF, Green Hub, Phyllis, Round Glass, Manta Trust, uh, that does a lot of work out, uh, out of the Maldives, again, with this Protect Maldives, Sea Grass, uh, the Ocean Agency, Coral Reef Image Bank, Conservation India, is just the website that I put uh, on there for you guys to look at to see how you can contribute your images. Of course, it's for free, but if you're interested and if there's a passion to, 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 to generate awareness and uh, create education, then uh, you know these are also organizations that uh, uh, help to do that. So, so take a look at uh, some of these, and then Kalyan, if you have any others that you want to add to that. No, I think that's a great coverage. I think that's a great coverage of, of uh, NGOs and things. And one of the things I strongly suggest is uh, attending, I mean, if you're new to the industry, uh, attend some of these wildlife festivals, conferences, and, and things like that. Um, because, uh, like, for example, in Bangalore, um, every year there is a conference called SCCS, um, which is pretty much the largest gathering of all wildlife researchers and conservationists in the country. And that's where, you know, sitting with our chai, somebody will say, hey, you know, I'm doing this project on 
uh, saving coral reefs, uh, and then you can just offer saying that hey, I can come and document it and and things like that. So um, I think uh, I run a festival called Nature and Focus. Unfortunately, it's not happening this year because of the coronavirus. But it's a place where pretty much you know we have a couple of hundreds of photographers and filmmakers who are attending it. So it's a great place to build up the network, uh, finding out about organizations and things like that. Namrata, your mic is muted. I can't hear you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. So we um, had a question from Bhere that he's basically asking. He's made a number of short films, and they were planning for uh, their first feature. So how do they find the producer for it, or how do they fell, uh, send it as finished work after it's done? So, I mean, it's it's very hard to kind of do the project completely on your own and then uh, expect channel, um, channels or whatever media organizations to pick it up. So it usually works when you're working with them before you uh, launch a product, you know, and, and that's where it helps. So um, unfortunately, Natural Research Space is a little, I mean, you can contact me directly, I can put it in touch depending on the kind of project. Um, but for example, um, in India right now, uh, Discovery Channel, which owns Animal Planet also, uh, National Geographic India and Sony BBC Earth, they are looking for people who can make um, 25 minute short films, you know, uh, and, and they're desperate for Indian content because they don't have enough Indian content. Um, there is this online platform called uh, Curiosity Stream. Um, I definitely ask you to check it out. It, it's more remotely US based. Uh, it's like Netflix, but only for documentaries. And the nice thing about curiosity space is that because it's an online thing, the length doesn't matter. You know, in a TV, they have to have a half an hour slot, but there it can be a 10 part series with two, two minute films, you know, where you feature one animal in every film or one short story in every film. And, and they're really looking for content as well. So uh, you can try out some of these. Uh, okay, great. Um, and also while Karnataka um, needed, I mean, it looked, I mean, sorry, it sourced um, footage from different, different agencies, different uh, cameramen, right? I mean, uh, my friend had actually uh, put in one scene for the film. So uh, there are opportunities like that. Um, Shishi Mehta, his, uh, I, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is, uh, I forgot his agency's name at that point. Um, but yeah, that was his, I met him at MBA, MBA school and he told me that, uh, this is what they've done. So that's an option as well, right? Absolutely. In fact, for Wild Karnataka, we started with a self-funded project and uh, we literally got best in the field, you know. So we obviously um, wanted to showcase underwater and, and of course, Munich is the only guy we know that who can do this, right? So that's how we kind of assemble the team. And, 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 and I keep going back to saying that specialize, you know, I think that's the key. Um, for example, uh, I don't know if I am near to see wild Karnataka, but there's a sequence about um, um, traps, you know, uh, a beautiful sequence about traps. And the reason we've done it is because there was a filmmaker, he actually has an IP job, he uh, doesn't do much, but he basically did it as a weekend project, you know, or a short 10 minute film. And then he realized that, okay, he knows already about traps, he knows where to find the right trap, which time of the year, where to be there. So we sent him, he has no experience in filmmaking, so we did a class course and sent him back in the field, you know. So having expertise in like specialization that Okay, perfect. Um just gonna see if there are more questions. Um Amrita is asking, will there be any future plans for wild Kerala? And if so, will the purple frog <laughs> hold a place in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, Purple Frog is also found in Tamil Nadu, and in fact, I'm lying. <laughs> but I'm sure Kerala has enough stories of its own. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Harshit asked a question again. Uh, if someone wants to do an investigative project in India, say like the one on Tiger Temple, Thailand, how does one go about it in terms of access? Okay. Uh, Umi, do you want to go first or? No, no, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So again, uh, the way I do it is working with NGOs. You know, if I was to do a film on tiger poaching in the CIA project, there's an NGO called, um, what, what's the NGO mean that Belinda Wright runs? Um, Belinda Wright. Uh, 
Belinda, I'm forgetting the name. WS, OPS, something like that. Sorry, I, I just look up Belinda right. Um, she. Sorry. No, nothing, nothing. Sorry, nothing. No, no. Um, so she does this kind of work, you know, she has this undercover, like a staff who work as undercover, you know, they pretend that they're buying tiger skin and things like that. So if you want to do that kind of work is to tie up with people who um, can give you that access. Uh, sometimes you can work with government agencies as well. So for example, if you go um, the forest department, you know, in forest department, most of the time they're quite happy to have films about their national park or things uh, taken. So if you go to the forest officer and say that, hey, um, you know, I would like to do this. Can I go when your team is going to arrest some poachers or things like that? And most often people are uh, friendly. So you can approach some of these government organizations like call the department or police. Okay, I, I found the link. I'm just going to share it on the chat. Um, okay. Hey guys, any more questions? I think we finished most of them. There was one question about equipment that Nika asked way before. Um, so would you uh, both want to recommend um, equipment for beginners? Yeah, I should that was I think specific for underwater, so I think only you should go for that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't. Uh, what equipment do you use underwater? What equipment do I use underwater? I use uh, uh, Nikon DSLR and uh, Panasonic GH5. So I use the Nikon for my stills. I still prefer it, and I use the Panasonic GH5 for video. Uh, but having said that, and having seen seen the industry change uh, over a while, and uh, uh, Mihika, you're welcome to message me separately and I'll have, be happy to guide you with uh, more detail. But right now you can achieve a lot with some of the point and shoot setups that are coming out there. They're a lot lighter, they're less expensive. You have accessories that you can add to them to increase what the capabilities of the camera. And so the Olympus TG5, TG6 series, Canon has a, a, an amazing point and shoot as well. Uh, I think it's called G7X or something like that. So they, the, the results that people are getting from these cameras are amazing. Amazing. Uh, and I always carry artificial light into the water. So whether I choose to use it or not is different. But uh, be because of light loss underwater, uh, a large part of my equipment is also the that I carry. So, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So, Shachi, would you like to mute yourself, no problem. Okay, so um, guys, any more questions? Otherwise, we can end it. I think there was one question somewhere earlier about uh, how do you get your work out? Uh, you know, social media and things like that. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> anyway, I, I think we covered most of it. But one thing I want to say is that definitely, whether I hate Facebook. But I have to be in a fa on Facebook because as an artist, you need to have a place uh, in social media. And of course, this is Instagram and some of these are better. Uh, but I just want to kind of reiterate the earlier point is that when you're working with NGOs, for example, Umi just mentioned that he's working with Dakshin Foundation to raise funds for um, you know, fishermen who are affected. Um, it's usually these NGOs that can amplify your work as well. You know, so for example, my first picture that got published in National Geographic magazine was a picture I took of actually a, a, it's not a wild, uh, well, there were wildlife pictures as well. It was a picture of uh, this conservationist called Ullas Karant, you know, you must have heard of it. He's a uh, well known tiger biologist. And and uh, it's actually, he works with the organization of WCS, and, and they are the ones who sent my picture. I even, National Geographic, I didn't have a direct connection. So it was they direct gave it to National Geographic, and then National Geographic contacted me saying that, you know, we got to see the picture and can we publish it and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, just collaborations and contacts go a long way in this industry. Okay, that's great. Um, sorry, I had one question. It would be better for your photos. Uh, what social media platform would you all recommend? I think uh, go ahead, go ahead. As Kalyan said, uh, I'm also not a uh, huge sort of social media person. So I 
whenever i feel like it i put stuff up on instagram it's not something that i you know use the algorithms and the you know three posts a day and hashtag this hashtag that all of that uh, it, it's just uh, i think my last post was quite a while ago so i don't know if i'm the best person to give advice on social media uh, uh, footprints <laughs> But I think that just goes to say that you don't really need social media then. You're but to get now, your work but that comes because of, I think, because I inhabit a particular niche, which is what Kalyan was saying, you know, uh, about specialization. So, Kalyan, you can answer. No, I completely agree. I, I, do, I don't get any work. I mean, once in a while, some requests are, you know, people know about it. But none of my work comes through social media and all that. It's, it's all through the networks and relationships that we've found over the years. Yeah. In fact, over social media, what I find is that I engage with people who have a lot of questions, so they get in touch with me over social media. I engage with people who want advice on equipment. So those are the kinds of people that uh, my uh, level of social engagement uh, uh, happens on social media. I don't have a huge number of followers or anything like that, and it's not important to me also, actually, to be honest. Um, so yeah. Okay. Cool. Sorry, my mom just needed some help. She's very bad with technology. Um, okay, so I don't think we've gotten any other question. Uh, wait, Manisha asked. Sorry, Manisha asked one question. Um, would putting up photos on platforms like Unsplash help catch the attention of environment-based organizations? I haven't heard of Unsplash myself, but neither have I. Neither have I. I also haven't heard of Unsplash. <laughs> there are many, there are many new ones that are coming out, which uh, some of us, like the older people, are not so clued in. <laughs> okay, cool. One question. Uh, I think you just before that, before Manisha, I think Arush had a question about how do you approach NGOs with your work. Yeah. Um, can you answer that? Can I help my mom? Sorry. Oh, sure, can I want to go to take that question. Yeah, yeah. So I think so. Uh, <laughs> I think no NGOs like it if you just give them a hard disk full of random images, you know. And and I think the key is to find the NGO or the individual there who's working on specific projects and offer a very specific body of work which you know that will be useful for them. For example, um, like there is this wildlife NGO called uh, Aranya, which mostly works in Northeast India in Assam and Arunachal Pradesh and things. So giving them a picture of let's say purple crop from Kerala is completely useless, you know. So, but if you give them pictures of um, uh, wildlife of Northeast India, uh, pictures of environmental destruction or, or conservation images from specific Northeast India, that would be more than willing to collaborate with you. So uh, you need to do a little bit of research in terms of going to the website, finding out what areas they're working in and try to find the right person. Some of the big organizations like WWF, some things like that, they have a full fledged media from the directly contest. But um, some of the other ones, you just need to do the research and, and come back to the direct. Okay, so, perfect. Uh, that was, to, sorry. to answer your question, uh, you said it is a platform for photos to be downloaded for free, actually. Uh, I would say that yes, if you have some photos that you have and that you're willing to make free to the public, like uh, what Kalyan was saying about the way he started off on Wikipedia, then by all means go for it. It will definitely bring more eyeballs and uh, more attention to your work. Uh, there's one more that I want to address which says, Malaika says, what are your thoughts on the issue of photo manipulation? Uh, so one of the ways that I've started to approach this now is actually uh, using the uh, photo competition framework because the photo competition framework is fairly clear cut. Photo competitions, when you, sub when you submit an image, they have a framework that says you're allowed uh, certain kinds of, uh, uh, you know, contrast and, uh, uh, you know, tone brightness and uh, adjustments. You're allowed certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, dust removal or spot removal, and you can crop to maybe 10 or 15 percent. And the rest of what I achieve, I try to achieve on camera. If I'm going to do a manipulation, so some competitions have a creative category where you can bend photos, you can take an element from here and put it there and things like that. If I'm going to uh, 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 edit a photo like that and where I'm going to change the photo from what uh, any single file that I managed to achieve while pushing the shutter, then I try to make sure that it is uh, very, um, that, I, that I state it very clearly in the caption that goes along with that. Uh, photograph and I think for me that is where I my my ethics uh, you know uh, kind of the, the line that I wish to draw in that regard okay cool 
Yeah. yeah. I agree with Tumi 100%. It's pretty much the same for me. Uh, I think more than the technicalities, the way I do it is that you're not misrepresenting the image. You know, yeah. um, I think that's the key. Uh, where I mean, sure, you want to brighten up a tiger's face or whatever. Those things, I think it's it's, it's all right. I think I, I think you just represent something, uh, add an element, uh, remove an element which which takes away from what the reality was. I think uh, that's the key. If if, if uh, 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 you know, if there's a fisherman in the background, when if, if there's a diver in the background, and and you're photographing, uh, let's say, you know, there are a lot of these popular destinations where you can swim with whale sharks. You know. So if you remove a diver there, I think that's unethical because you're sh showing that there's a world that exists without people. But if you have people, there people that like like Umid says, if you what I would do is I just wait for the person to move out of the frame or hide him behind the fish or something like that. Just avoid it they are in camera as much as possible and not in and software. Okay, cool. Uh, so um, I think there are no more questions. So I think we're able, we're going to be able to close the event. Um, there, sorry, there was one question for me uh, from um, regard, uh, from Gozia. Hi Gozia, so I haven't been able to record the sessions. I've been very ill prepared. Um, hopefully, if uh, a lot of you are on coming for the for 5 o'clock session, then I can transfer it to Zoom and then I can, I'll be able to record the session. So I'll send you all a link and then we can take it forward and meet again in an hour. But I think otherwise we're good to go. Thank you. Great. And um, maybe time. you can share our email addresses with the people. So if you have any other further questions, feel free to contact us. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Do that. And Umid, you can share the list of uh, organizations with me. I'll send them to everyone. I will do that. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Okay. Perfect. Thanks again for your time. Thank you everyone for joining. Great, Namrata. Thank, 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 thank you for organizing this. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll be Bye. sending all the money. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Bye. Bye. Bye.